Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vagam Radian here in Northern Virginia. We're covering the Surface Navy Association's 30th Annual Conference and Trade Show. Our coverage here is sponsored by Leonardo DRS, but we're here over at uh, Rolls-Royce uh, uh, Marine North America stand to talk to Davis uh, Sanford, uh, who is the uh, Naval uh, Ship Intelligence Lead uh, at, the, at the company. Uh, Davis, thanks very much uh, for the time. You guys have that uh, uh, cool uh, display uh, behind you. Um, Rolls-Royce obviously known for its power Power systems driving everything from the new Queen Elizabeth class carriers. Power systems are, are in uh, Zumwalt class ships as well as uh, in LCS. But we're here to talk about your uh, autonomous ship uh, capability that you guys have. Uh, you guys are a key provider of, of systems across uh, the, the maritime piece, especially in the commercial world. Talk to us about what um, and, and the investment you're making and the technologies you're developing for autonomous ships, which are a major um, element of surface planning, subsurface in the United States. I mean, everything is being focused on autonomous systems. Talk to us a little bit about what you're bringing from the commercial side of the business into the defense space. Yeah, so Rolls-Royce Ship Intelligence on the commercial side is based over in the Nordic countries. They're working on making unmanned to um, reduced manning, sorry, reduced manning to unmanned to eventually fly autonomous ships. Um, right now they're operating a 28 meter tug in Copenhagen Harbor that's remotely operated from shore. Uh, what we're doing is taking that technology they're doing with energy management, equipment health monitoring, uh, situational awareness, and bring that over to the naval side for naval applications. Uh, to improve on longer, larger ships, and then also we are working on automating and then aut autom making autonomous the ship systems themselves uh, that you're not seeing on the smaller USVs because you don't need it there right now. So looking at you know cooling water, ship systems, fire protection, um, how you keep engines running for 90 days on the larger vessels, medium speed diesels without having anybody manning it, uh, fuel transfer, all that type of stuff that you need to do right now that it, a chief engineer or an engineer crew on board a ship typically deals with, uh, as well as you know the regular bridge stuff that also goes along with USVs. So we're we're taking that commercial technology and bringing it over here, and then specializing it for yeah. naval applications. And what are uh, some of the bigger challenges and hurdles you guys uh, have identified, uh, whether from the tug program or anything else that you guys are doing? Um, to refine this for, you know, sort of what are, what are some of the longer poles in the tent? Because some of the technology is ready for prime time, others it's going to take a little bit more work. So some of it is trying to work with different manufacturers. Um, you know, it would be great to always put Rolls-Royce equipment on everything. Um, we're developing our system such that it can go onto any party's equipment, kind of pack on as a modular system because you know whoever the shipbuilder is and the ship owner, that it's never going to be fully all your equipment. So we're having to make it that way, so that way it plug and plays into other people's equipment and then working with the manufacturers to get the equipment, their reliability up, their uh, mean time between failures down and uh, get the uh, long endurance out of it. So that way the different ship systems can work. Now, how much of this is um, you know, a sensing, a proximity issue, and how much of it is, you know, as you said, more reliability? What's the balance between those two? So if you're looking at operating the ship, you know, driving it around, it's a sensing hardware, technology, computational type of work. Uh, if you're looking at ship hardware stuff, it's a mixture of censoring the ship and monitoring everything, uh, you know, putting extra sensors onto the engines, uh, so the way you can remove having to have people monitoring them, um, but also the mechanical side of it, of just equipment, hardware, making sure it doesn't break down, it can go longer and meet the endurance requirements that the navies are expecting and want out of it. Talk to us about um, how far out this is before we see Commission naval craft out there that are autonomous, that are beyond just development sets, but that the technology is at a point in a maturation where we're going to see this. You know, is it a five-year horizon? You know, is it like lasers where you know every five years it's five years out? You know, how far out is it before we start to start to see an operationalized form of these platforms out there that are delivering effects for people at greater uh, uh, economy? So. I I think there's a couple of things that are going to slow it down. Um, commercial side, IMO is slowing that down for us. Uh, uh, inter International Maritime Organization. Actually, just because there aren't rules for who's in charge of a ship and if there's no one on it. Uh, I think you're going to run into that from a Navy side. I think it's more open to going unmanned without having that, but also there is the dangers of, you know, it's a naval ship that doesn't have anybody on it and worried around that. So I think it's still got another 10 years of development on it. Um, but I think you're going to start seeing them, especially with the Overlord program that's being bid right now by multiple people and stuff, that you're going to move there quicker. 
Um, but to see something fully operation the fleet, I think you're going to be in probably 2025, 20, 2035 range, somewhere in there, to be a, actually see them out there operating, um, not at a prototype level, you know, at a, you know, a comfortable fleet level where they're not, where they're working with it. Um, yeah, and I, I can imagine, especially for any, you know, tanker or cargo ship, even though they they steer autonomously, uh, oftentimes uh, they are, um, there are still people on it to firefight and to deal with a casualty if it happens on the ship, as opposed to having something gigantic careening around and, and folks trying to figure out um, what, what to do about it. Talk to us a little bit about the specifics of the Overlord program that you just mentioned. So the Overlord program is an RFP that's out right now. It, uh, it's actually due Monday, the closing. Uh, so they're looking for a vessel that can do 90 days endurance, 4,500 nautical miles at 19 knots, uh, working, you know, manned at the beginning by people testing it, but completing a bunch of vignette, vignettes uh, around making, following coal regs and making sure that prove that the vessel can operate by itself autonomously. Uh, so there's a lot of different systems that you're going into there. The vessel, to get that type of endurance and operating the sea states they want, you're getting into much larger uh, than what they are right now with, say, the Sea Hunter program. So. And, and the they is? The U.S. Navy. I just, I just wanted to, I just wanted to be clear. Uh, and uh, the U.S. Navy. And uh, last question to ask you is, um, you guys do have that very cool graphic. Talk to us about, you know, this concept that you have up. You know, what are its attributes? It looks very different. But you were explaining it looks very different because it doesn't have to look like a regular ship in in in, in many respects. Talk to us about what you guys are are putting together, what you're proposing, and and what some of the conceptual thinking is going into that platform. Yeah, so this is a 60 meter vessel based off of our uh, SCADI 55 meter OPV design. Uh, what we've done is obviously made it more unmanned. You don't have people on board, you don't need a bridge. You can get rid of a lot of the systems for people, habitat, all that extra stuff, so that opens up space for something else. Um, you want longer endurance, so you're going to have to have more fuel on it. Uh, this is a fully electric drives uh, vessel, so um, you can get more endurance and reliability out of going to an electric ship versus a mechanical drive. Um, so doing that, but it's really a pickup truck uh, with a, this one's designed more as a single role mission uh, with, you know, you put on specific op options versus a multi-role type of situation for this vessel doing surveillance, uh, ASW, MCM, or uh, if you're looking for more in the smaller countries, especially, you know, coastal patrol, that type of stuff that can help support and augment other uh, forces going on. And, and to explain acronyms for people, call regs were international collision regulations, OPV is an offshore patrol vessel, MCM is mine countermeasures, ASW is any submarine warfare, right. <laughs> and, 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 uh, and you have some very nice cross-banding actually with, with Northrop Grumman on, on the fire scouts you, you have uh, going, going off of it, but that's really you know, amazing and a number of other folks we've talked to are mating autonomous and autonomous, where an autonomous surface ship is deploying an autonomous underwater vehicle, where in this case where you guys are envisioning an autonomous surface craft deploying uh, autonomous systems. Is there a challenge with putting autonomous systems on autonomous systems if, if, as we've seen from other folks, you know, they're mounting, you know, they're putting an uh, unmanned underwater system or autonomous underwater system that's deployed by an autonomous surface craft. In this case, you have an autonomous surface craft that's also deploying autonomous air vehicles. Is there a challenge in making mating two sort of completely autonomous systems on to, on, with, with one another? Uh, I think absolutely. I, you look at how long the Navy's been trying to do UUVs with USVs. Uh, I don't have a ton of experience personally with trying to do UAVs with USVs, um, but it's something you're going to have to work through. You know, that's Simply, unmanned air vehicles with unmanned surface vehicles. Thank you. Um, it's going to be difficult. I mean, simple things like getting it down under the deck if the sea's rough and tying it down. How do you do that if there's no man there to help tie it down? How do you move it back and forth around the deck to get it out of the way? Those types of things are going to have to be worked through, and it's going to require multiple manufacturers working out because it's not all one single manufacturer doing this. So it's going to be collaboration across industry in order to be able to make this work. And I think there's absolutely a need for it, and it makes sense to do it. Um, and we just got to work there towards it. But there's definitely no solution at this point that I know of. Um, and, and there you go, and there you have it. The aviation bosun mates are going to be assured to have some form of job security into the future. Uh, Davis, thanks very much. Really Thank appreciate the much. conversation. Look forward to tracking the program. Thank you very much. I appreciate the time.